Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. So we've been in a series called On Your Mark, and uh, we're in Mark chapter 7, and so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there now. Um, if you brought a Bible, I should say, go ahead and turn there now. If not, it'll be up on the screen. Uh, it's called On Your Mark to kind of give you the understanding that it's at a really fast pace, that when we start going today, we're going to go really quick, and um, which kind of is a little bit confusing, because when I say really quick, you'll... That might make you feel like the, the service is going to go really quick, but there's a lot to get through. We're going to go really fast through a lot of stuff. And so um, I've really enjoyed going through this so far, looking at the life of Jesus in the book of Mark. And uh, it's just powerful. It's powerful to see who Jesus uh, is, not just was, is, that, that he has power over everything. And so we've seen these amazing stories. And we ended last week um, hearing about him walking on water and it freaks out his disciples. And for the first time, we see them worship him and say, like, this is the son of God. And so um, I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump right into Mark chapter 7 today. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, we're blessed to be able to come together, to worship your name, to hang out with your people, to be in your presence, to get into your word. God, I pray that you would do in us what only you can do. God, I pray that um, you would get all the credit, all the glory, uh, that we would boast in you, have our hope in you. Um, God, I, I just pray that you would do supernatural things inside of us, drawing us to yourself through your spirit, and, and that our relationship with you would grow uh, as our understanding grows. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. So here we are in Mark chapter 7. And Mark, when he uh, starts the book of Mark, lays out where he's headed and what he's about to do. In Mark 1 and verse 1, it says, the beginning of the good news, that's the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, that's Jesus the Christ, the, the Son of God. And so the whole goal of this is to show through the stories that he's about to lay out um, that actually happened, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God. That there would be no question in it that you would see by the action-packed book that we've been going through at a breakneck speed, like that's got to be God because nobody's ever done or will ever do what Christ did while here on earth. That he's the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. Are you with me? Cool. And if you've been here for the first um, six weeks, you've hopefully seen that. If not, uh, I hope that you would check it out online so that um, you feel up to speed. So, here we go. Mark 7. If you're taking notes, um, I kind of gave it two titles. Good versus God. How many know that sometimes good can get in the way of God? Um, and, or, or you might want to call it tradition versus truth. Tradition versus truth. <clears throat> the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law. <clears throat> so the religious elites who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They came from Jerusalem, uh, which kind of... Uh, gives us the idea that they would have been high-ranking Pharisees and, and religious rulers. And so they, they show up and they gather around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Okay, let me explain this to you. Um, we saw earlier in the book of Mark that the Pharisees and some of the rulers would come around Jesus and watch what they were doing just, just to accuse him. Like, they didn't show up to go like, oh, this is awesome. Let's hear. This might be the Son of God. Let's hear what he has to say. But they showed up to say, like, we're going to watch what you do, and we're going to accuse you of things to try to take away from the strength of your word. And so they show up. They're watching. And Jesus' disciples um, don't, well, let me explain this. Wash their hands before they eat. That's not like us today washing our hands for hygiene. Because how many know we could look at that and be like, that is unclean. That's gross. Right? Like you're kind of with the Pharisees on this one to, to an extent. Um, but understand that's not what they're talking about. They didn't have an understanding of germs like we do now. And, um, and so when it's talking about uh, the unwashed, defiled hands, well, it kind of explains it here. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. This is not a hygiene issue. It's a tradition and ceremony issue. But when it came to 
to eat, it wasn't about like, hey, get the soap and, you know, sing happy birthday twice while you're using hot water and soap like they teach you in the food handler's permit class. Like, here's how long you need to do it. This is what, that's not what it is. It's a ceremonial thing. Like, they have this tradition because uh, in the Old Testament, the only ones that ha- had to do the ceremonial washing were these, the priests that were, were in, in the um, temple that were doing the, the, the offerings and things. And so what they had done is they took that, they tried to overlay it over all the people, and they made all these rules. And so they literally had, like, paragraphs on paragraphs on, like, this is how you clean before you eat. But it, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't for hygiene. It was to show that you're elite and you understand all the rules of cleaning before you eat. Are you with me? They somehow made a greater chore out of a chore. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. <laughs> and that word wash there um, is the same word we get baptized from. It's basically when they went to the market and they'd rub up against Gentiles, people that weren't um, Jews or religious elite, that... that they would feel defiled and dirty, and they couldn't even eat until they come ho- came home and like did their ceremonial washing of their whole body. Huh? I, all about the outside, all about how it looks, not for sanitation, but for ceremony. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. If you didn't understand maybe the traditions of the day, you would think like that makes sense that you would wash those things. Right? Again, it's not talking about doing your dishes. Do your dishes. Wash your hands before you eat. Those are good things. This is talking about doing it in certain ways and, and, and like I said, making more of a chore out of what is already a chore. I hate washing dishes. Could you imagine like having to wash them and then like having to go through certain ceremonies and traditions before you could use them each time? So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? It's interesting because in Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus gets accused of the, the same thing. That it says here, when Jesus had finished speaking, this is chapter 11 verse 37, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, and maybe you've heard this before, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. The Pharisees were always about ritual. They were about the outside. They were about traditions. They were about how they looked to everybody else so that they could feel more holy than everyone else. Look at what we do, look at how we do it, uh, and didn't really deal with the real issues. How many of you have the option of drinking out of a mug that's either clean on the inside or clean on the outside? What do you go with? I don't care what it looks like on the outside. I don't care what you see. I'm concerned about what I'm about to drink right now. Are you with me? Um, but, but the Pharisees were worried about how do I look? How do I look? And so at the same time, they're, they're drinking down death. They're showing everybody that things are good. The Pharisees are awesome because they uh, give us somebody to point at and be like, these guys are idiots. When really, when really we often are them. That we'll have a tendency to want to show everybody how holy and righteous we are when on the inside we're dying. or We're dirty. We don't deal with issues that are past surface level. Um, In fact, that's our focus often gets on the surface level. Like when we, we feel God calling us to change some things in our life, to repent and move on from some things in our life, oftentimes the first thing we want to change are the outside because we want to show other people that it's real. Oh, you can't keep up with that. That'll eat you up. Allowing God into our hearts, you can, well, we'll get there. Let's keep moving. Back to Mark, it says, He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. <laughs> a hypocrite is an actor. It's a pretender. Could you imagine if somebody just said that to you? You, you make a statement to them about how great you feel you are in Christianity because of your outside ritual and tradition, and, and they just straight to your face call you a hypocrite. It was a, it was a shot calling you a faker. Okay. It's an actor or pretender. As it is written, this is in Isaiah 29, 13. These people honor me with their lips, external, but their hearts are far from me, internal. They worship me in vain. 
In vain is, is uh, if you look that up, it's without effect or avail. It's to no purpose. It's improper and irreverent manner. It's without real significance, value, or importance. It's baseless and worthless. We can do that now pretty easy. In fact, you're more apt to do that if you grew up in church feeling like you had to show people that you were churchy. During worship, that can happen. Here, we can be worshiping and you feel these different feelings inside of, of, well, you probably wrestle through all kinds of stuff depending on what end of the spectrum you're on. If you tend to have more of a, a, a Pharisee type of heart sometimes, then you, you want to do it, but it's not because you love God, but it's because of a show. I'm not saying you, like, don't take this, well, maybe take this, that kind of way. Um, or sometimes we're on the other side where we, like, don't want to do anything because uh, we, well, we just don't care. And so there's these, these extremes, and what God really wants is our heart, because when you love God, you can't help but obey. But when it's all about obedience, you can do that without loving. So God goes to the heart. He wants our heart. And knowing that everything comes out of that and, and flows from there. In fact, the greatest commandment is this. Love the, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Listen to this in verse 8. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Like that's what you're putting your hope in. Not you, but that's what's going on here. He says, you, you, you held, used to hold on to these things. You, you held on to God's commands. You let go of those so that you could hold on to the traditions of men. How, how many know that if you had to step back and look at those, it seems like it would be very clear that one is much more important than the other. But it's so easy for us, even with our own hearts, myself included for sure, um, to want to appease people. Like, oh, I want to do it the way these people want me to do it. Instead of going to Scripture maybe and saying, like, okay, God, what do you want? God, what is it? I love you. I want to please you. I'm not into pleasing people. I want to please you. Okay. You have let go of the commands of God, the truth, and are holding on to human traditions. Traditions versus truth. And he continued. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Um, It's interesting. All of us need to just, at some point, sit down and ask God, God, my views of you and the way that I should follow you, how much of that is from your word and that you've commanded and how much of that is because someone told me to when I was coming up? It's a, it's a maturing process of all Christians. Because it, it's normal that someone coaches us, mentors us, disciples us, and shows us how to go about following after God. But it has to be your relationship with God, that you're growing in Him, that you're understanding what that looks like, not living off of somebody else's experience. And, and so um, it's good that you would have somebody that would show you along the way that they're walking down this path further ahead of you, that you would kind of glean from them, but take that and go back and look at it. And see, like, why are we doing this? Is, this? is this because we love God and out of the overflow we're obeying his commands and this is what that looks like? Or is it because it got passed on from generations of tradition? Because people oftentimes are bound or, or feel like church and following God is way too much. Um, it's too much to handle. And the things that they're really struggling with aren't the commands of God, they're the traditions of men. Okay. A fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And then he's going to give us an example right here. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. You have to understand that the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law obviously would have known who Moses is. Uh, they would have been experts on all that Moses said, knowing that Moses is the one that went up on the mountain, that spoke face to face with God, that came down glowing, that gave them the commands of God, that, that spoke for God to the people. And so when he says, didn't Moses say, he's saying like, you know that God told you this. For Moses said, 
honor your father and mother. That's in Exodus 20, verse 12. That's one of the Ten Commandments, by the way. Kind of a big deal. It made, it made the big list. Top ten countdown. Honoring your father and mother isn't just about um, a position of perspective or reverence, although that's part of it. It's also about taking care of them, especially as they go, get into old age. We're horrible about that in America. Now, I'm not saying you. I'm saying the culture is horrible about that. People get older and we don't feel like they produce for us any longer. Then now we have to help them instead of them helping us and we push them to the wayside. Huh. Honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. The Old Testament doesn't mess around. It, <laughs> And to curse them would be, if they came to you asking for help in their old age when they couldn't take care of themselves any longer, it would be cursing them to say, like, you go figure it out, get away from me. Don't talk to me about me and my stuff. This is mine. You'd be cursing them to death. They don't have a way to take care of themselves. So this is his example about their, their traditions that they've now started to trump the truth with their traditions. Honor your father and mother. This is what Moses said. Anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, <laughs> what a shot. We all know that Moses is the guy in the Old Testament that speaks the commands of God. And, and you guys all memorize the first five books of the Bible where, where Moses is the one writing those and all over those. And, and yes, you agree. Moses wrote these. And then you say something else that you right now are saying, I'm greater than Moses by saying it. Okay. But you say, that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Let me make this make sense. It, it explains what the word Corbin is there. Devoted to God. Now, how many know that devoting something to God, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, to, to say, okay, this is God's, but... What we have to understand is that this was a wicked way that they would get around doing to ha having to do God's law. So God says, honor your father and mother and don't curse them. You're to be put to death. And so knowing that, you knew that as they were no longer able to take care of themselves in the same way, that was your responsibility as their child. That they took care of you when you were a little baby. Now it's your job to return the favor to honor God in that way. And in doing this, um, what they did with this Corbin thing is what they gave people the opportunity to do is say, this is uh, devoted to God. I don't have to take care of my parents anymore. It was, a, it was a verbal thing that sounds holy but was actually wicked. Because what it meant was, I don't have to uh, do what God says because it would cost me something, so I'm going to defer my obedience to the cost of my family. And so even though they said devoted to God, that sounds holy, right? Like it, it's not bad. Like churches all the time will be like, hey guys, I'd love for you to make a pledge for how much you're going to give so we know what that looks like. And what they're asking is, what are you devoting to God this year? That's not wrong. But, but what happened is, what they would say is, so let's say my parents need help and biblically it's my responsibility first before it's the churches or anybody else's. It's my responsibility first to do everything I can to help take care of that. I could get out of that if I just declared Corbin. So parents come to you and say, hey, we need some help. And I go, Corbin. It was wicked. It was their way to, to try to supersede God's law with a way that says they're devoted to God but actually is not at all. In fact, they have these weird rules where like Corbin, you could use for yourself. You could not even devote, give any of it to God or the temple or any of that stuff until you died. But you could still keep it from other people. It was, your, it was you trying to act. It's like sometimes people ever come to you and say, like, God told me, and you know God didn't tell them. And the reason they say that is because if someone says, God told me, what can you say? Oh, God told me that, and you're like, that doesn't sound like God, bro. Like, it's not true. Like, you wanted that so much that you wanted to, like, stop me having the conversation with you. So you said, God told me. This is what's happening here. It, oh, trump card, devoted to God. Oh, you sound really holy right now in your wickedness. So Jesus gives them the example. Listen, 
You, you're, you're not about the heart of what's really going on. You're not about following after the truth. You're about your traditions, and actually you're, you're, you're wicked in doing so. Thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. <laughs> Three things he just said there. He said, you let go of the commands to hold on the human traditions. You set aside the commands to observe your traditions. Right there it says you nullify the commands. The word of God, the truth, by your traditions that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. <laughs> this is just him coming like, well, here's an easy one. Uh, how about Corbin? That's the one where you guys are wicked and you go after your traditions instead of the truth. And you do many things like that. That's just scratching the surface. Uh, you know that in, uh, that's not just an Old Testament thing to take care of your family, by the way. I just wanted to point this out. Um, in 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. Um, just thought you should know you can't be like, oh, that's Old Testament, man. I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> we should let that hit. So we see Jesus. The Pharisees come. They're trying to accuse him. He flips it on them and puts it right back on them. Is it about your traditions or is it about God? And let's understand that we can be biased by our traditions. And we can put pressure on people because of our traditions. In fact, many of our church preferences come from traditions not out of the Word of God. Okay, let's keep moving. If you're taking notes, right, heart check. <clears throat> Again, Jesus called the crowd to him, this is in verse 14, and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. How many know that that's, sounds like something important is coming? He calls them to him, and he looks right at him and says, listen to me. Everyone, understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. In Matthew it says, by going into their mouth. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And then it's interesting. See verse 16 on the screen? It just says 16. It doesn't say anything else. And then it goes to verse 17. Your Bible might do that too. Um, it's just a missing verse. It's not actually a missing verse. Uh, what it is is right there it says... Uh, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. That's what verse 16 says. The reason in your Bible it's not there is because the most trusted manuscripts of the book of Mark don't have that in there. And then some of the other manuscripts they, they found do have it in there. It's not wrong to have it in there. It's clearly something Jesus said regularly when uh, explaining things to the crowd. Um, but that's, I just thought you should know that I'm not hiding from verse 16 by hiding verse 16. Your Bible looks like that if it's a, uh, like a newer NIV version or something. Um, and what it says there is, uh, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. It is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And in Matthew, if you follow this story, it says that the disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard uh, this saying? So he had just turned at him and said, like, you're wicked for your practices. You, you follow tradition over truth. And then he pulls everybody close to him so he can really start to dig. And he says, it's not what goes into a, mount, a, a person that defiles them. It's what comes out of a person that defiles them. And the disciples come to him and say, like, you just offended the Pharisees. Which is actually, like, I'm sure he was like, because that's what his goal was, right? <laughs> After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. <laughs> Are you so dull, he asked. <laughs> Jesus is awesome. How many know that people would go to HR over that right there? <laughs> Can I get a witness from the HR guy? Um, that sounds rude, right? But he, he just, he's just, well, it's just, his 12 guys came to him. That's how guys can just deal with each other and just be okay with it, I guess. Um, are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body? I don't have to explain that. You get it? And when they talk about heart, 
um, in Scripture, it's the center of one's being. It's their mind, emotions, and will. It's that, that deep place of who you are. It doesn't go into their heart, but in their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And everybody said, bacon. <laughs> Let's go. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. In Matthew, it talks about what comes out of a person's heart or out of their mouth. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. <laughs> sexual immorality. That word right there is a catch-all phrase for sexual sin. Uh, sexual immorality is kind of a, a big word to say anything outside of the context of how God made sex to be experienced. Um, and so, biblically, we know that when God made sex, it was for um, a, a committed, married man and woman um, to experience uh, benefit in that. Um, and anything outside of that is considered sexual sin um, and sexual immorality in Scripture. So, uh, sexual immorality, theft, we know what that is, murder, adultery, greed, which is coveting, I, I want more for me, I want yours, I want everything, malice, which is malicious evil, like you just plan and think evil, um, deceit, so deception, lying, lewdness, envy, evil talk, sl or uh, evil look, excuse me, slander, which is more like the evil talk, abusive words, arrogance, so, so pride and superiority, I think I'm better than other people because of whatever. And folly, which is foolishness. All these evils come in from inside it and defile a person. Dang it. Just understanding that, um, that's why oftentimes uh, you'll hear me say, like, don't follow your heart. Follow God. If you follow God, He'll work everything out. If you follow your heart, watch out because your heart is wicked and out of it come all kinds of wickedness. It's an internal issue that, that Jesus wants to deal with, not the external, not the food that comes in, but the things that come out because they reveal the, the state of your heart. And uh, James 1, 13 through 15 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Uh, therefore, like think about this, temptation is a circumstance, an opportunity, or an object that awakens our evil desires. A lot of times it's not even an evil thing, but it shows the evil desires that we have. Like money, in and of itself, is paper. It's, not, it's nothing. It, it's, but, it, but if I stack it here, you, you could say, well, I don't know whose money I'm stacking. Can I borrow some money to stack? Um, but, but if I stack it here, then, then what happens is you get to see what's going on in your heart. The, the attractive person that walks by that's not your spouse is not a sin that they're attractive walking by. Well, maybe they're doing it on purpose in a sinful way, but, but in and of itself, it's not a sin. But what happens is that the evil desires of your heart make it bad. Hmm. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Or some Bibles say, desperately sick. Who can understand it? That sounds kind of depressing. And hopefully you can understand by me giving a couple examples um, that it's true. That anytime you start to feel like your heart is perfectly pure, um, there's, when the temptations walk back around, that's the, that's the heart test. That's the heart check. That's re really seeing what's going on. And so it sounds kind of depressing, but um, it only is because uh, our hope isn't in us or our ability to change our own heart. There is hope for our heart. Uh, the hope for our heart, listen to this in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, it says this. I will, this is God, sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will 
cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. There's all kinds of hope. Why? Because God loves us massively. And if we have a relationship with him, it's because he did something. He decided to come in and turn our hearts from stone into flesh. He decided to put his spirit inside of us. He moved so that he would get glory and we would benefit and find great joy in walking in relationship with him as a new creation with a new heart. So I don't have to feel bad about, oh, my heart's evil. Yeah, your flesh is always evil. But God is so good, he gave you a new heart. Second uh, Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Exclamation point. That's exciting. Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So Jesus says the issue is not what you eat or the defilement of doing all these traditions. The issue is your heart is wicked and needs to be dealt with and it's not something that you can do on your own. You can do all these practices to try to do it. You can do all these rituals, all these ceremonies, all these traditions. It still won't do what really needs to be done. Only God can do that. You can't follow enough rules or come up with enough ceremonies to to all of a sudden be clean now. Like now I've finally done it. I finally, check I did number 100, the bucket list of a clean heart. It doesn't happen that way. It's that we turn it over to God and God does what only he can do. That he can regenerate, make new. That he would pour his love into us, assuring us that we have a a new heart and a new spirit inside of us. Will we still be tempted by things? Yes. While we're still in this flesh on this earth where it's broken and flawed, as he's perfecting us, I hope it gets less and less. I hope that the same things that, that maybe the stack of money that used to tempt us in our greed and our coveting, uh, maybe as we grow and grow and grow, it, it looks a little different each time we see something like that. Until eventually we see it and go like, ah, it's just money, man. God used that for something. Are you with me? Cool. Uh, and then I just had one last side note. Um, Guard it. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it, or life flows from it. Guard that. It's new. It's made new. It's filled with love from the Holy Spirit. You're filled with His Spirit. That we should protect that because it's precious. When it talks about the heart, like I said, it's talking about the inner person. It's the, the, the deep down, the emotions, the, the will. It's that down deep space. Um, And what you believe in your heart is what you actually do. You know that. Because what happens? Sometimes our head tells us we should do one thing, and then the list of all the evils we just did is what we end up doing. And you go, why do I do that? That's not what I wanted. Oh, it's because you actually are driven by what your heart really believes, not by what your head believes. And so that God wants to deal with our heart. And not, not just what we can put on on the outside, but our heart, our heart. Today, he wants to deal with our heart. Huh, that's good news, if you're wondering. Can we keep moving? We have to. Verse 24, uh, if you're taking notes right, let a crumb fall. Let a crumb fall. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of uh, Tyre. I'm going to mess that up. Your brother might say, and Sidon. So he went, he went there, um, which is outside of ancient Israel. So when he's in Capernaum, he's in the Sea of Galilee, there's huge crowds everywhere, everybody's coming to see him. He's been doing all these miracles. Um, he, he decides to take his guys and travel outside of ancient Israel to this place. Um, but he wouldn't have been unknown there because the big crowds that were showing up earlier in Mark, uh, it told us that some of the people that came, came from these two cities to come see Jesus and see what's going on. So they would have known who Jesus is, uh, at least some of them would have. Jesus shows up there uh, and says he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. (laughs) Yet, he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, 
As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit, it's a demon, came and fell at his feet. We've seen this uh, as a common theme. People are broken and need help, and when they come to Jesus, they come in a proper way. They come down on their face at his feet as a sign of reverence. You have power to do something. I don't, so I'm coming here to worship you. Hmm. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. In Matthew, it says she's a Canaanite. In fact, we're going to see that in just a minute. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. It means she kept asking. In Matthew 15, it kind of gives us a little more insight. Verse 22 through 23, it says, A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out. This is the same lady. It's the same story. Um, Look at this. So she's a Gentile, but she comes to him and, he, and calls him Lord, and then Son of David, which is a, a, a Messiah term. Like, that's a term, a term used knowing that you're the Savior of the Jews. Like, you came in the line of David. Um, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. As if demon possession wasn't bad enough. She's suffering terribly from it. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. When you read this maybe the first time without some understanding, it it sounds maybe rude. It sounds like, in fact, you're going to see in a moment, it seems even more rude. Um, Because it seems like Jesus is just ignoring her, kind of pushing her to the wayside. She's coming broken, crying out, calling him by the right name and asking for her daughter to be saved from demon possession. Listen to this. This is Jesus' response. First, let the children eat all they want. He's talking about the nation of Israel, the Jews. He told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread. The the bread he talks about in Scripture. In in fact, in in John 6, he says that he is the bread of life. The, The generations before had manna in the desert, that he came as the bread of life, and those that eat from him have eternal life. The children's bread... Uh, it is not ready to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. That sounds pretty harsh. Right there, the term dogs is a little different than where we've seen dogs, maybe other places in Scripture. Uh, dogs in those days, oftentimes when they referred to dogs, they referred to dogs that lived outside that were wild and vicious. Um, this is a term for little dog. It was much more like our house pets, uh, the small ones. Um, and, and so literally, it's, it's the term for a dog that would come underneath a table and eat what fell from, it was, it, was a, it was a house pet. It was a family pet. It was one that you fed your family and then you took care of your dog because that's the order of how things go. And, and this here is not him having a, like a derogatory statement towards this woman. It's him giving a, a clear understanding of how the gospel is going to go out. Hear this because it can be hard to hear if we, or hard to maybe receive if we don't hear this. He says, first, First, let the children have all they want. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What he's saying is, there's an order to the way that I'm about to do this. I'm here on mission in a certain order. And so it's to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so he knows that, that he's the savior of the world, everybody, for the Gentiles also. And he talks about it all over the place. But at that time, he says, I came to save the Jews. And from then, I'm going to save the world. This is awesome, her response, though. She doesn't get offended. We get more offended for her than she gets offended, by the way. Yes, Lord, she replied. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Hmm. She's like, I'm not offended at being called a dog. Can I just get some bread? Oftentimes, the, uh, the Jews called Gentiles dogs, but they were referring to the vicious ones out in the streets, calling them dirty and unclean. This is not that kind of term. This is a term of saying, like, you're a loved one that gets taken care of at the house by, by the master, but it, not in the order of uh, understanding uh, of priority. And so Jesus came with a very clear mission, a clear plan. And so what she's asking um, is, I know, she has, sounds like good doctrine and theology. Um, she knows that he's the son of David, that he's the, the one that came to be the king of Israel, the one that came to save the Jews. Um, and, and she understands here, like I get it, you're here for the children, but can you just let a little bit fall now? While the children are eating, don't the crumbs fall and the dogs get to eat then? 
What she's asking is, that's awesome that you're going to save the Gentiles later. Can right now you just give us a little bit in advance? Can we get a little preview? I'm here right now and I'm not leaving till I get a crumb. And so she says, like, that's great, but I'm that dog that doesn't leave from under the table. And so she asked over and over because her daughter was demon possession. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. And so he's not answering. He finally answers and says, like, it's not time for you yet. And she says, that's fine. It's time for everybody else. Can I get a crumb? Listen to this. This is awesome. Then he told her. In Matthew, he said, woman, you have great faith. How cool is that? And Marcus says, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. <laughs> One little crumb. Pretty powerful crumb. She went home and found her child laying on the bed and the demon gone. Praise God. So listen, what he was saying is the Jews aren't the end, but they're a means to the end, and that's why there's this order that's happening. Let me show you something. In Mark 16, 15, the end of this book that we're in, it says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Clearly, Jesus had a plan for all. Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. What he's saying is not a derogatory thing. It's not something to try to be harsh to her. It's him saying there's an order and a plan of how I'm going about this. And right now, that's not, you're, not, you're out of order. And then still, anyone who turns to the Lord and puts their faith in him will be saved. She says, like, I know it's out of order, but my faith is still in you and I need help now. And he says, like, let me break you off a crumb. Huh. Romans 1, 16, 17 says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the is it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is awesome. Because let me tell you something. Uh, not many people I know in this room are Jews. We're all Gentiles. Um, and... and God had a plan to reach us from Jerusalem, that it would go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And so we're in Washington hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ brought to us because of his beautiful and divine sovereign plan. That's good news. And so we see here um, him even uh, going, uh, meeting that woman where her faith is at and blessing her in that moment. And now to close out... Um, Chapter 7 of Mark. If you're taking notes, right? Freedom of speech. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon um, down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, already Jesus went from like the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, to Tyre and Sidon, which is outside ancient, here I'll do it this way, ancient Israel, like to the northwest, Tyre. Sidon is like above that to the north. So he takes this big trip to go to Sidon and then around the Sea of Galilee down to the Decapolis, which is way down here. It's the ten cities. Um, and and they, they think that it would have been a trip, the whole trip, about 120 to 150 miles. This is not a quick trip. Uh, it's, a, it's a slow one that we don't know much about, but we know he took his disciples with him. He'd already done most of his ministry now in, in Capernaum, Galilee. And so he's doing like a training, like, you guys come with me. I wish we knew everything that was said during that trip. That would be awesome. But he goes all the way down and comes to the Decapolis. And I don't know if you remember, but uh, the guy that was demon-possessed with Legion, and Jesus said, you can't come with me. Instead, go back and tell everyone about what the Lord has done to you. The guy goes back to the Decapolis. When that happens, he goes back to the ten cities and starts telling everybody about who Jesus is and the goodness that's happened as the demons were cast out of him. And so Jesus is coming now into a place that the word has already been being spread before he shows up. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. He had a very deep and thick uh, speech impediment. He wasn't quite mute, but close. And so he would try to talk and he just couldn't get words out. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. I read this differently than I've ever read it 
uh, this week. And some of that's because I, I take in a lot of brilliant minds that love Jesus during the week while I'm studying. Uh, and I just kind of had a different view of this because I always thought this was a weird way that Jesus goes about healing this guy. After he took him aside, away from the crowd. <clears throat> this is a man that is deaf and mostly mute, could hardly talk. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Many people think that that's like a saliva thing, like he spit maybe on his hand and then touched the man's tongue. Um, so Whether it is or isn't, it's at least... Or maybe, are you with me? Sounds kind of weird. You're like, what are you doing, Jesus? Remember the other guys? You're just like, be healed, they're healed. Like, why don't you go that route? <laughs> Went with the wet willy approach instead. <laughs> well, listen, I think it can make sense. I think it can make sense. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh, whew, said to him, Ephatha which means be opened with an exclamation point. Be opened. It doesn't say in Scripture why he did this, but in thinking through this, praying through this, and, and really like taking in some other great pastor's insights into this, he isolates them away from the crowd. Isolation for communication. That, hey, it's just me and you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, let's go through this. The man is deaf. He can't hear anything Jesus is about to say. He's deaf. Well, how do you explain to somebody what you're about to do if they can't hear you? Jesus gets them away from the chaos because that's a little bit of extra massive stimulation where especially if you can't hear what Jesus is saying, there's a lot going on. So he pulls the deaf man that can't talk away to the side and looks at him and goes like, I'm going to do something with your ears. Or, or however he does it. I'm going to do something with your tongue. Looking up to heaven would show that he's, everybody in that culture, whether you love God or not, knew that God was above. So he goes, like I'm calling on God. How cool is that? Let me get this guy away from everybody and help him understand what, what it's about to happen right now. Be opened. And immediately, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosened. And he began to speak plainly. No speech therapy classes, no, none of that. Instantly, he just, I don't know, I wish I knew what he said. Wow, that was cool. Thanks, Jesus. Like, I don't know. Who knows? But listen to the, the intimate one-on-one -on -one get away where God meets him where he's at, where Jesus takes him to the side to say like, I, you, I, you need to understand what I'm about to do for you. I'm about to reach and touch where no one else can and I'm about to go there and, and I'm, this is for the credit of God, by the power of God, this is about to happen. Okay. All of a sudden the miracle doesn't seem quite as weird maybe anymore. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. It's kind of a big deal. And it says the more he did so. So that wasn't just a one time like, hey, obviously he kept saying like, don't tell anybody. Hey, stop telling everybody. You know what I mean? Like it just keeps getting louder and louder and more and more and spreading throughout the crowd because they're so amazed. At look, in fact, what it, look at what it says. People were overwhelmed with amazement. That means astonished beyond measure. So go to as far as you can be amazed. They were more amazed than that. They didn't know what to do with themselves. They're like, I can't believe what I just saw. <laughs> he has done everything well, they said, or perfect. And he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. He has done everything well. He has done everything well. Can I tell you something? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything he's ever done, he's done perfect. He's done everything well. 
In Psalm 18, verse 30, it says, As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. In James 1, 16 and 17, it says, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He's always been perfect. He's always only done good. He still continues to be perfect and to only do good. And he'll continue to always be perfect and only do good. Our God is mighty and worthy to be praised. His work is perfect. Even when sometimes it's confusing from the outside, he's got a plan that's greater than I can comprehend. And he works all things together for good for those who love him. So that we can say, God, I don't understand what I'm going through right now, but I love you passionately and my trust is in you and I know you've got me. God is so good. I know we went through a lot today. The traditions versus the truth that we would go down to the heart of matters and to his word, not to what we've heard that our heart would be in check with him and we would have hope in the fact that God changes hearts, not only our own, but you know, that's why we pray for people that don't know Jesus because we believe that he can change a heart. That we see him with order but with compassion move uh, from afar, heal a daughter that's demon-possessed somewhere else she gets healed. And then we see him take a man off to the side When he comes with his brokenness, he's bound. His tongue, when it says it's loosened, it's like it it, it is the picture of someone being in chains and then breaking free. I just want to say, like, I, I don't know how you came here today. I don't. God does. Maybe you come here today and and it's to put on a show. I want to deal with the outside of things, but I don't want to deal with the inside. And today it's convicting to say, I love you and I want to deal with the inside. He's not afraid of your mess at all. He can handle it. In fact, he already has. He did it on the cross. And to show that that it's taken care of, he was resurrected, (laughs) ascended and sits on the throne. Don't have it be about tradition or ritual. Fall in love with Jesus. Don't try to obey just to to prove something or to show someone. When you love Jesus, you can't help but want to please him and obey his commands. Because it's not about trying to put on a show for anybody. It's out of the the overflow of, of understanding his goodness and wanting to just show him love. Maybe today you feel bound or you feel broken and need healing. Um, let Jesus just take you away for a moment. As we get into worship here, uh, let it be about you and him having some time together. Yes, it's corporate worship. It's beautiful when we all sing to him. But allow him to speak to your heart. Hmm. I'm going to pray and then we're going to worship together. As you go to leave today, there'll be an usher at each side um, with a blue bucket. And uh, what those buckets are for is to drop in the two things you got before service, the connection card and the offering envelope. If you came ready to give today and you you had it on your heart um, to give financially with tithes and offering, uh, that's where you can drop it or there's even a box out there to do so. The connection card. God wants to connect with us. That's why he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled in a relationship. Also, he wants us to connect together as the family of believers. And so the back of the connection card is just that. God, what's the next step today? God, what is it that you're asking of me on this journey with you? God, I want to move in those ways. And so I pray that you would look at it. Whether it's the first time giving your life to Jesus, through Jesus and what he's done is the only way to have a relationship with God, to be right with him and forgiven of our sins. Maybe it's time to recommit your life to Jesus because you've been walking uh, away from him, following after the Maybe the bad things in your heart. It's time to allow him to do a work in that. Maybe you're ready to be baptized. That'd be awesome. That is an outside thing, but it's to show what's going on on the inside, not to prove anything to anybody. Uh, Becoming a member of the Roots. uh, Biblically, um, you're, you're called to be a part of the family. 
you need to find a local congregation that you're um, engaged in and participating in. Um, and so I hope it's here. Uh, if you're interested in, have, in having to be here, we have tonight at 6 p.m. at the church office, we have a membership class. I'd like to join a community group. We need each other walking on this journey. I'm interested in serving at the Roots. That would be awesome. We want to get, where you, get you where you best fit and glorify God most. And then I will. Um, I don't know what God's put on your heart today. I don't know what it is. But God does. And His Spirit is here. And it is in you if you're a believer. Ask Him. Then prayer requests and praise reports. We're going to have prayer partners on the side after we uh, start to worship here. If you need prayer for anything, go ahead and see them. And, and like I said, is after we worship together and head out, go ahead and drop those two things in the offering buckets on the way. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, you are so good. And God, I, I believe that every single person here is here because you want them here. God, help us not to, to run from the things you want to speak to us. Help us to have soft hearts and not hard hearts. Help us have ears to hear and eyes to see. God, help us to, to hold on to the words that you've uh, just deposited in our hearts today, Lord God, and have them do a transforming work inside of us. God, for those far, I pray that you're drawing them near. For the broken, I pray healing. God, for, for the places of broken relationship, I pray for restoration. God, we know you can and we ask that you do. God, in clear and mighty ways, we ask that you move. That we could not take the credit. We would boast in the goodness of our God. God, I pray that right now you would be uh, speaking to us as a group and an individually. That we would understand the heart that you have for us. How much you love us and take care of us. I ask all of these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.